Kia ora and welcome to the Niggly Niche Cast. I am the Diggity Duda Doc. You already know me as Slipper the Slippers. I am here with the Wobbly Wildcard and we are going to talk through a few little Black Caps cricket things before we really start to dive into World Cup preparations. The Black Caps had a tri series over in Australia. Tom Latham's got a finger injury. Peter Fulton's got a new job with Sid Kakite to New Zealand batting extraordinaire Craig McMillan. So a couple of Kiwi cricket things to discuss with the wild card. And wild card, this is when I'm going to introduce you, so you better be prepared and ready to say hello to our beautiful listeners. Did you, wild card, happen to catch... The Aotearoa New Zealand Warriors performance last night, Friday night, defeating the Penrith Panthers. I've just finished writing about it. How do you feel as a neutral fan? Hello to our beautiful listeners. Um, I am not entirely a neutral fan at this point because of um, it's not something I want to discuss because it was a rather traumatic event for myself. But a week earlier, a week prior to the Warriors beating Penrith, uh, they also won another game, so I, I find it a little bit difficult right now to to um, to chair on the Warriors even as a neutral, but oh man, I I did watch most of that game and I didn't, I don't know, I, it's, I haven't read your piece yet because we're recording pretty much straight after, so I, uh, I'm not sure what your uh, take on it was, but I didn't find it a very enjoyable game of rugby league, to be honest. There were so many errors and just like, the Warriors didn't have to do anything because the Panthers are just piss right now. Yeah, it's got a. It might be a dual written thing yeah. because it's it's a bit complex when it shouldn't really be complex. Because on the one hand, I was really uh, happy and uh, impressed with the Warriors' performance. There was a certain energy, a certain attitude that the Warriors need to show to win games of footy, and then you factor on top of that how Cody Nakarima is fitting in to this refreshed Warriors team, considering that you've also got uh, Patrick Herbert now starting at right centre. He's a live wire. Carl Lawton coming off the bench, and Isaac Luke was fantastic in his 40 minutes on the field. But, <laughs> my golly old gosh, the Penrith Panthers suck. They're a mess right I've, now. I don't I don't know how they suck so bad. So it's kind of like, yeah, the Warriors were good. Um, The Warriors' defense was really good. They repelled multiple sets in which the Penrith Panthers didn't make an error. And then on top of that, the Penrith Panthers managed to make multiple, way more than multiple. I don't even know what's next after multiple, but multiple errors in like try-scoring motion. Um, but on top of that, the Penrith Panthers, like just so many penalties against them, so many uh, poor defensive efforts, so many errors in the play the ball, and just stuff like that, which the Warriors just absolutely ransacked them. So it's more of a case of just, oh, well, I don't think you can say it enough how terrible the Penrith Panthers were, and given the whole situation at Penrith that we've been through over the last year or so, it's kind of laughable, it's kind of funny just watching them implode. So kind of got to be walk the fine line of really celebrating the Warriors in different ways that I observed and highlighting those those efforts. But yeah, the Penrith Panthers absolutely sucked. Um, of course, if you enjoy the niche cache, you can support us on Patreon or any other which way that you feel... Um, happy and enjoyable with we're out here just talking our kiwi sporting things so however you want to support us whether you're on youtube give it a like subscribe itunes rate and review facebook tell a friend get some buzz patreon support us directly or any other way we're we're eternally grateful for that support and we are i don't know about you wildcard but like I'm in a good mood this morning because you're just writing about that Warriors win. You know, the sun's shining here in Auckland. But now when I think about the Black Caps and their World Cup chances, the last week has kind of put it in pers- 
perspective for me that the Black Caps probably won't do anything at this World Cup. And based on what I wrote after their tri uh, not tri series, so why did I say tri series? Their three game series over in Australia against an Australian 11. Based on the fact that that Australian 11 featured across the series, it featured everyone in their World Cup squad. Whereas the Black Caps, they just had five players from their World Cup squad. Stuff like that is still happening. And there's no way I can see a strong World Cup performance if those, like, they're overlooking details like that that you need to be at the highest level to win or compete strongly at a World Cup. And it's not it's not present with the Black Caps. It's not present with New Zealand cricket. And... That is that was like a reality check that we are still dealing with the Black Caps team that whether it's arrogance, whether it's just silly buggerness, I don't know. They're just not not the players per se, but the organization around the team is just not preparing them for a real crack at a World Cup, given what Australia did in the same series and given what other teams like we've got an England Pakistan series happening right now. What are the Black Caps doing? Those those sorts of things are uh, reminded me that we are we are dealing with the black caps here. Yeah, and it's not just England, Pakistan either, is it? Like West Indies and Bangladesh played this morning. There's I think Sri Lanka have been playing as well. Um, even teams like um, Ireland and Scotland have been getting international games lately. And I yeah, we're just what waiting for fellas to polish up their. Um, tax returns after the IPL or I don't know like it's there doesn't seem to be like an absolute priority of making sure we get the best preparation and I guess that's just maybe a little bit of that she'll be right attitude I don't know it's not really what you want going into a massive tournament especially when you know the the Black Caps aren't the best team in the world they weren't the best team in the world in 2015 either but they made it to the final they did pretty bloody good I don't think they're as good as they were four years ago, but they're still in a situation where, like, if their best players fire, if Trent Bolt takes a bunch of wickets and Ross Taylor and Kane Williamson score a bunch of runs, you know, they can beat anyone on their day. So I don't see... I don't know. I I don't see why they shouldn't believe in themselves, but I don't see how they're putting that into action in order to, like, not cut any corners, make sure of every detail has put them in the best situation in order to have success in England, and yeah, nah, doesn't doesn't really look like that's happening right now, which isn't to say that they won't do well at the World Cup, it's just that they are cutting corners. They definitely are. You do have Ross Taylor, he has been playing in England for middle six, I believe, uh, through the the one-day competition over in England, so we at least Ross Taylor's playing one-day cricket in the same country as the World Cup while a lot of them are playing T20 cricket in India, which is definitely a New Zealand cricket staying friendly with India and staying friendly with their main players who um, aren't afforded the luxury of playing in the Big Bash League or a bunch of other major T20 tournaments around the world, but you can play IPL because we're friendly with uh, the BCCI. So I just want to make that situation well aware for folks at home who are wondering why Black Caps are playing in the IPL when many of the best one-day players who are preparing for a World Cup aren't in the IPL or had limited involvement in the IPL because they went back to prepare for the World Cup. New Zealand has a um, a, a very strong relationship that isn't exactly a two-way relationship. It's a one-way relationship with the BCCI. The word intimidation means, fit in as well? Yeah, and Friendly that intimidation. is likely to flow into World Cup stuff where the black caps will probably not do very well how are you like what's a what's a how would you view a successful world cup like making the semi-finals making the final like what's your what's your kind of basement level of a of a successful world cup campaign for the black caps 
Semi-finals seems like a fair call. We made the semis the last couple of times, haven't we? So you know, it's this is this has been traditionally even even in some of the times where they haven't looked like the best uh, team that we've sent to a World Cup out there. I think that 2011 team, in hindsight, wasn't up to much, but the 2015 team was great. We are one better. You know, they do have a history of doing quite well in this tournament. So I'm not ruling anything out, certainly, because I think there's, there's issues around the team in terms of just how well prepared we are, and there's certainly... Where it's really hard to get rid of those, like to shake off those ghosts from the Champions Trophy, where they just they got the preparation and everything so badly wrong, and then paid the price for it. It's hard to shake off that that feeling, but this hasn't been as bad as that, and we do have a better idea of what the team's um, tracking like. So, yeah, they, they I'm keeping an open mind about it, but I think semi-finals is probably the benchmark right yeah especially given the the confidence from new zealand cricket and the kiwi public around the black caps we both believe that much of it is an illusion with regards to the black caps um, because they win a lot of games in new zealand and they perform very strongly against weaker opposition in new zealand and i'm very interested now to see how that translates into a major tournament given what we know about the preparation and planning for that major tournament. And you need to you need to like let it stack up. So we had the Champions Trophy debacle, and we had a few bits and pieces in between, and then we had the most recently the wicket-keeping situation in which there was zero planning, zero preparation done in the selection of Tom Blundell. And now we have a three-game series against Australia where arguably the best cricket nation in the world one of like three best cricketing nations in the world have decided to play all their world cup players in this three game series whereas the black caps nah we're too good for that we don't need to do that we'll just uh lads five lads and then yeah a few people that like hamish rutherford was in England playing for, I can't remember off the top of my head, like Northamptonshire or Nottinghamshire, one of those teams. Doing bloody well. I think he hits three centuries in like seven games, one-day games over in England. He had to leave prior to a semi-final to play one game of that three-game series. So he flew from England to Australia just to be part of that series and he played one game. Like, what's the point? <laughs> if you're Hamish Rutherford, surely better preparation to be World Cup cover is to be playing in England and then just stay in England and just be part of, uh, like, or be around the Black Caps, be as close as possible to the Black Caps in case of an emergency. Instead, Hamish Rutherford was flown back to Australia, play for one game. Like what's what? What is the point of all this? So it's all very confusing and confuzzling. Um, now we have the issue of Tom Latham's broken finger, which may or may not impact the World Cup. There are a couple of warm-up games. The Black Caps will play official warm-up games prior to the World Cup. They are too cool to play these uh, unofficial warm-up series that a lot of the other nations are playing. So that will give Tom Latham some time to heal up, but it kind of, I don't know, just how are you feeling about Tom Latham's injury, knowing that we have Tom Blundell now in the World Cup squad as well, Tom Blundell yet to play an ODI? Well, that was another one of the, yeah, the, like you said, the wicket-keeping scenario. This is exactly what they were hoping wouldn't happen, is that, you know, they wanted Tom Latham to just play every game and and Blundell's really only there as hypothetical cover, but he might have to strap on those gloves and um, swing the willow around a little bit in that opening game if Tom Latham, you know, has a setback or two. Or you, you never know here. I don't think it's um, drastic or anything. I don't. It doesn't sound like it's a serious injury that's putting him in doubt going deeper in the tournament, and it is a long-ass tournament too. Like we're talking longer than a month here, so... Even if he does miss a game or two at the start, we do have the cover there to to um, work around him. So I'm not like 
freaking out by that thing, but I do think it's quite funny just because specifically of that situation where they didn't pick a guy who could have covered Tom, like, the guy who could have covered Tom Latham the best, who they had been preparing to cover Tom Latham because he had a a bit of an injury that was maybe going to clear up by the start of the tournament, but he wasn't going to be available for any of the, um, any of the warm-ups or anything leading into it, and Sim Seifert, and now Tom Latham's in the exact same boat. It's, um, it's almost like a Murphy's Law thing, isn't it? Yeah, and it's in a way it's kind of good that they did select um, Tom Blundell. Yeah, I guess so. because he, if Tom, if Tim Seifert's unavailable, having Tom Blundell in the squad is now could be a beneficial situation, especially if Latham isn't going to play in a couple of games prior to the World Cup. At least you can have Tom Blundell. Uh, getting a bit of experience in that environment to some extent. Tom Blundell had a solid uh, series, the three-game series. Tom Blundell did manage to score a few runs, I think, off the top of my head. He had a 77, 13 not out, and an 11 in those three games. So it's okay. Will Young was the big winner, but of course Will Young was never given an opportunity to play an ODI over the summer in preparation of the World Cup. So now we have arguably one of Aotearoa's best batsmen in Will Young, who is not part of the World Cup despite just tearing up this Australian 11 team, which featured their World Cup bowlers. So again, that's another lev- another nuance of this lack of preparation because... There was a situation over the summer where the Black Caps needed another batsman to come in, and it was either Will Young or George Worker, and then Henry Nichols went to open, and neither George Worker or Will Young were given a crack over the summer to even just try and prove themselves at that level. And we could have had a situation where Will Young and George Worker play sublimely, they're in fantastic form, play their way into the World Cup mixer, or at least just we know more information about them at that level, but neither was given an opportunity. Will Young, you know, earned a test uh, debut that didn't quite come, but he earned that selection. He was the best batsman in that New Zealand eleven, and because of a lack of preparation and planning over the summer, now Will Young just hangs up his uh, cricket boots. Todd Astle was given an opportunity to, you know, play some extended games for the Black Caps and work his way into the World Cup squad, and then he didn't make his way into the World Cup squad. So it's funny how these things go. Um, the main concern I have with the Black Caps at the moment, regardless of of some of the selection things going into this and who's injured and who's not, is that even if everyone were all fit, I'm not sure that we know what our best eleven is. I think there's question marks over who opens. Um, if Blundell has to come in, then where does he bat? I guess he has to slide down the order to, you know, six or seven or something. Does that mean Jimmy Neesham drops out? Does Jimmy Neesham play anyway? Which spinner do we pick? Is it Santner or Sodi? Do we pick both of them? Um, there's three or four or five positions that are absolutely locked on, but then there's other ones that are just up in the air, whether it's, whether it's someone like Nichols. Does he play? I think he plays, but does he play as an opener or does he bat at six or you know there's these questions that certainly a team like England who expect to win this thing they don't have these questions right now and Australia I don't think have these questions right now India certainly don't have these questions right now so yeah um (laughs) I'm, I'm not really sure like this this does come back to what you're saying too it's like the the way they treated the um Considering they don't have games at the moment, like specific warm-up games, they're gonna once they get to England, okay, they got a couple of things to give everyone a chance to roll the arm over and swing the bat a few times. But they had a fair bit of ODI cricket in the home summer, and they didn't use it to sharpen up their very best team. They used it to chuck like lifelines to players who were only ever on the fringe, and they got some good efforts out of some of their best players but still like it wasn't I don't know it wasn't it's just another example where I'm not sure they prioritized the priority here working in the Black Caps favor is the fact that they will play every team over the course of 
uh, the World Cup. So you play every team and then the f- best four teams go into the semi-final stage. So there is that kind of elongated process could help the Black Caps settle, like use the first three games just to try something. And then if it doesn't work, you can tinker it to settle on a best first 11 or different players or different combinations. So I think... Uh, I don't think it's a good thing what they're doing, but I do believe that the World Cup format will help the Black Caps iron out a few areas of selection. But yeah, as you said, there's no comparison to these other teams who are far more talented than the Black Caps already. And then they are already also settled on their best kind of combinations for the World Cup. And I think you got to, at the moment, it's kind of England, India and Australia are tier one favourites. Pakistan are lurking and Pakistan and South Africa are kind of the, the teams that could do something if they play very, very well, as was always the case. And then my dark horse, my funky candidate is the West Indies. And there's more West Indian upside for me than there is Black Caps upside. Like if the West Indies catch fire, they are going to be a lot more threatening than if the Black Caps catch, catch fire. Like the West Indies, if they are hot, they could go all the way through and win the World Cup. If the Black Caps are hot, they might make it to the semi finals. And that's just a, that's just like matching the Black Caps up against one team. Then you have the big dogs, England, India, and Australia. South Africa are going to want to prove a lot of people wrong. Pakistan won the Champions Trophy in England. The Black Caps don't even fit in there. Let alone when we think about the lack of pre- planning and preparation around the Black Caps as well. And you're wondering, well, the Black Caps are already starting on the back foot and they're not really being put in a position to take this World Cup by storm. So it's a rather interesting time just in this like little quiet patch before the World Cup gets underway. And these are habits that they've been showing for a few years now, and largely the Black Caps have got away with it. I mean, the Champions Trophy was a disaster, but then they, you know, um, just bounce around. They don't play a lot of away cricket at the moment. They haven't been traveling much. They just for whatever reason, but they've been coming home and pumping teams here and beating teams that are worse than them as they always do. And then you know sparks up the old uh, the old um, hype wagon back in back in New Zealand and people. I I don't know. With New Zealand cricket, this just seems to be such this um, such this massive recency bias where when they play well in New Zealand, it's all forgotten what they did on their last away trip, or in this case, their last away trip was to the UAE, where they did really well, but still. Um, yeah, it's, that's the thing, is that they, they have these things where it's like, they're giving themselves a 60-70% chance. Like, they they are cutting corners a little bit and taking things a little bit too easy and maybe not, not being serious as... To certain other teams who are really like putting all their eggs in the basket of we're going to win this World Cup and obviously they're not all going to because only one team can win it but you look at with several other teams uh, prioritizing it that much and we're sort of taking it easy a little bit it's like for the most part they've gotten away with it so it's not something that gets massive focus in the way of like certain other you know sporting organizations in this country and around the world who have consistently made mistakes and it becomes a big like narrative talking point the black caps don't they like they don't put themselves in a position where they're just at, where they're just like chaotic and disastrous they just don't quite iron everything out to the ideal situation so that's i think that's why a lot of this feels like a counter narrative when we sit here on a podcast talking about this and it's just not what you would hear about the black caps if you turned on like tv1 or tv3 news at 6 45 and they had a piece about them you know it'd be something optimistic and happy about kane williamson is plotting on scoring you know buckets and buckets of runs at the world cup and 
as opposed to maybe that there's a little bit of a sly thing going on here with some of these weird selections. There's a bit of a, a bit of a, it's not a negative per se, but I think there's some shadiness about, about the new batting coach, for example, we'll probably get onto that in a sec, like, there's just little things which probably aren't going to be the reason why they lose, like, their team's better, like, good enough to overcome any of these small, like, inconsistencies, it's just that when you have them over and over, it's hard not to feel like they could be putting themselves in a much better position to be successful at this World Cup, and... They're, they're not quite, but I mean, whether they have that ability anyway, maybe they're just waiting on luck because they know that both teams on the day show up, play to their potential. The Black Cats probably can't beat India, England, Australia, maybe even South Africa, Pakistan, possibly even the West Indies, you know? Although I think the West Indies just lost to Bangladesh. I'm not sure I didn't check the scorecard on my phone, but I know they were playing. Do you know, I'm going to use Trent Bolt and Kane Williamson as the markers here because they are the Black Caps kind of number number one batsman and bowler for the ODI format. Do you know when Kane Williamson and Trent Bolt last played an ODI in England? Uh, when did we last tour there? It would have been 2017, maybe 2016. But start of, start of the year 2017, I think. To the best of my knowledge, it was the Champions Trophy. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Champions Trophy. So the Black Caps haven't been back to England to play ODI cricket where the World Cup is going to be played since the Champions Trophy. Uh, am I crazy or does that just sound ridiculous in itself? Well, considering that's like the low point of the Black Caps over the last five, ten years... Yeah, you probably want to exercise a few demons first. Just just get experience because not a lot of these black caps are playing one day cricket in the Royal London one day cup uh, as part of the county cricket circuit either because they're usually playing IPL cricket. So there is a while other nations have prioritized playing ODI cricket in England, again, the black caps decided not to because they're too good or too cool or whatever. And you want to talk about Peter Fulton. What's your what's your little take on Peter Fulton? I sense a bit of angst. I sense a bit of... Fuck Peter Fulton. <laughs> oh, I mean, Peter Fulton seems like the nicest bloke in the world, so never anything personal about, about two meter Peter. It's just that I think this is the same as what we've just been talking about, where it's like there are reasons why this doesn't make perfect sense and it's probably not going to be like a disaster so it's not going to blow up in their face so it's not going to be like this is just an obviously terrible decision because it's not an obviously terrible decision I'm just a little bit uncomfortable about quite a few aspects of this for one thing here is a dude who was an outstanding first class batsman who you know had a bit of that Matthew Sinclairitis about him where he didn't turn that into consistency at the test level but what's his job now is to help batsmen transition from first class to the black caps and become consistent test match and odi batsmen seems like it seems like a little bit of a um a i mean it's not that he can't do that because maybe the fella who didn't learn is the guy who is in the best position to explain what he got wrong and how other people can get it right so that's okay in itself, but then you add that to the fact that, okay, he's replacing Craig McMillan after the World Cup. Now, Craig McMillan is in that same position where he was probably a, a better, certainly in ODIs, he was a fantastic um, ODI batsman. Uh, had a great test average too, from what I recall, but he was always inconsistent and have these real dry spells and get dropped and then come back, you know. He wasn't consistent at that level, and you wonder how that goes with someone and their technique when you consider as well that McMillan was always a dude who liked to improvise and play just dumb shots and he'd get out in stupid ways sometimes and he's the dude who's been teaching these batsmen to make the most of their abilities over the last few years and you replace that with someone like Peter Fulton who had a solid technique but it was his specific technique because just his his height being like six foot seven or whatever he was and continues to be like that that meant that he wasn't a typical batsman 
So he's coming at this from someone who had an, a non-typical technique. Also not sure that that's ideal. The most, like, the weirdest part of it is that, of course, he's a Canterbury fella. Coach Gary Stead is a Canterbury fella. When Peter Fulton made his first class debut, Gary Stead was his captain for Canterbury. When Gary Stead became the coach of, Cap of Canterbury later on, Peter Fulton was his captain. And they won, like, I think they had a spell where they won three out of four Plunkett Shields or something like that. So they had great success together, so it's obviously a good work and relationship. It just also feels a little bit like jobs for the boys. Of course, Craig McMillan, who was there before Gary Stead, but also a Canterbury fella. Um, Fulton's contract expires at the same time as Gary Stead, which I think is after the 2020 World Cup. So that's also a little weird. And then you look at the fact that Peter Fulton only just retired like a year or so ago, minimal experience as a coach. He has been working with the, um, I think it's the, like the winter um, coaching stuff with the New Zealand cricket high performance, whatever they call it. And I think he, I understand he was also the batting coach for the under 19s working alongside, I think Paul Wiseman, another Canterbury fella. So it does seem like he's also been pushed into this top role. Like this is, one of the obviously the top coaching position in the in the country is Black Caps coach. Um, Black Caps batting coach would also be fairly close on that as as a top like specific technical role, and like this dude's been doing this for a couple years max and not always full time, and he's all of a sudden straight into this role. That's just like combine all of these little things. I'm not sure this is an ideal uh situation but it does seem like an extremely typical situation but i guess it's still better than having a first class bowling coach from australia who averaged like 60 or 70 with a first class bowler so i guess that's still a, a benefit on top of that and it's not the first time we've seen a, a um you know the coach having chummy relationships within the unit as well because i think to be honest uh, Mike Hesson and, and um, Brendan McCullum probably pioneered that one. Uh, Mr. Shane Jurgensen averaged 30 in first-class cricket, but he averaged 68.37 in a list A cricket. Ah, there was, that's what I was getting at. There you go. So, yeah, but we're there. I think um, the more telling thing of Shane Jurgensen's time, and again, like, nice blokes, and no one's holding anything against him, but... Who has improved as a bowler under his tutelage? It might only be Trent Bolt, and you get the feeling it's the same as saying, like, who improved under Craig McMillan? Well, probably Kane Williamson, but, like, Kane Williamson was going to get there whoever his coach was, and I think Trent Bolt was also another inevitable case, and I'm a little more worried about the, like, fringe guys who have taken it. Like, Henry Nichols is probably the best um, case study here, who, of a guy who took some time to find his feet internationally and then just had a great summer recently. So it's not like there's no one there, but it's, yeah. Yeah, New Zealand cricket shenanigans is all. To wrap it up, Wildcard, I'd suggest not worrying too much because I believe what we're going to see and what that will lead to the niche case highlighting, the proof will be in the pudding. And I think we are. <laughs> I don't. I, I'm. I'm feeling a very doom and gloom vibe in my body, um, <laughs> and I don't want to be the bringer of doom and gloom. But the, I just want to prepare people, which I'm going to do. I'm going to probably take a lot of your ideas that you've mentioned here and write about them today. The I just want to prepare people for what I believe and I think what you believe is the most likely outcome based on what we know right now. Based on, on facts, on the reality, what is the most likely outcome? And I think the most likely outcome for the Black Caps is a reasonably terrible World Cup campaign in which a lot of issues get exposed. And... From that, considering how the White Ferns are performing at the moment as well, I think that will 
there will be like I don't want this to happen. I'd I'd rather the white ferns and the black caps are super successful regardless of who is in charge and who is making these decisions. But I just think the reality is that we are heading towards a point where the veil and illusion of New Zealand cricket being a successful organisation is going to be torn down and World Cup failure is going to result in some serious questions being asked considering the lack of preparation planning, considering how the White Ferns have fallen away drastically over the last 18 months, considering all the stuff we've talked about at the niche case over the last you know four years i think it's all kind of leading us to this point at the world cup kind of like how everything led up to uh the battle of winterfell against the dead or the <laughs> the uh great metaphor probably more fitting is the denarius uh sacking of king's landing because that's that's it feels like we're getting to that point, like where it's just it's 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 bonkers. It's just crazy. It makes no sense. It's it's terrible. It's horrible. Um, it's losing the plot, and I think we're building up to that point. That's just how I feel now. It might change in a week's time, and it might be a interesting episode of the Nishcast next week as well. I believe they. I just had this up, so. Offer a bit of information here for the listeners. The Black Caps play two warm up games, one against India on the 25th, which is next Saturday, and then another one against the West Indies on the 28th. So maybe we will come back to talk Black Caps World Cup cricket after those two warm up games and just lay down the scenery, the landscape, the setting for what will be a very interesting and uh, broad reaching, wide reaching World Cup campaign for our Black Caps wildcard. Until then, kia kaha.